Right, so um, thanks for the introduction, Dan. Um, welcome, and just to echo what Dan said, congratulations on getting out of bed so early. I really don't know how we've all done it. Uh, thank you for Biomadam for picking this slot. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk to you about unmet need in haemophilia. So this is sort of my passion is assessing disease areas and understanding what needs to be done there. There's some of my disclosures. And in particular, I'm going to discuss the chest study. So kind of, uh, I've met lots of people in here. I'm um, the chest guy, I think, is what I quite crushingly get referred to a lot, uh, as a lot. Um, and basically, this is a piece of research that's ongoing and we initiated it in 2015. And the, the project itself came about, um, so I was elected onto the UK Haemophilia Society Board of, Direct, uh, Board of Trustees, um, and still proudly a member of that board. And they said, this is wonderful, we've got a health economist, you can help us evaluate things and deliver value messages to support better access for patients to treatments as they come along. So I said, fantastic, where's your data? I need data to do my job. And he said, this is haemophilia, there is no data. Um, so that's effectively where the initiative came from. So why did we do it? It's a bleeding disorder. We're growing in numbers because we are multiplying more effectively than we have done historically for obvious reasons. We have extremely high patient costs, which is very rare compared to other conditions, whereby you really do have to justify every penny of investment in lots of other conditions. And perhaps we didn't have the rigor to understand, the rigor in our evaluation and economic evaluation in particular, to understand where that investment was going and why it was being made. And we've got policy makers who are not really ready for this. So ICWIG, who are the HTA body in Germany, released a report um, a few years back, which effectively challenged the use of prophylaxis. So it wasn't, let's think about how we invest and develop for the future with all these new novel agents, it was like their actual stance was, well, let's roll back. Should we even be investing in prophylaxis? So we felt this was a good time to do some meaningful health economic research. So this is a methodology slide. So chess, what is it? So it's a cross-sectional chart pull. So effectively, we recruit physicians um, in the first wave of the study, we recruited 138 haematologists from across the European five, which are the five largest markets within Europe. So France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the UK. Um, we were governed by a steering committee of key stakeholders, and I think that's a theme that you'll pick up from both mine and Professor Skinner's talks as we move uh, as we move along is that stakeholder engagement is absolutely pivotal to successful research, particularly within a, th uh, within a rare disease area. And so we had Liz Carroll, who's the chief executive of the Haemophilia Society as chair. Mark Skinner um, was deputy chair. And then we had the presidents from the other Haemophilia Societies, um, also members of that board. But then we had academics, health economists, and a Mike Macris, a Professor Mike Macris was the physician as well. Um, the field works and the information was developed by a team of brilliant yet socially inept health economists. Um, they're essential, but quite painful to be around. Um, and our methodology was as such. So we recruit our physicians, and like I say, we got 138 of these guys. And they then recruit the next eight to 10 eligible patients into the study. So our inclusion criteria was inherited, haemophilia, severe in adults, A or B. So in other words, the adults severe A and Bs. So that was the criteria for this particular study. 
So they provided us, they recruited 1,285 severe haemophilia A patients into the study, which accounts for approximately between 14 and 17 percent of the entire severe population across the five countries, depending on which, which reference you look at. And for every patient, the physician transposes the medical record into an online database that gives us the natural history of the patient, which we'll have a little look at in a moment, but also the economic information, so how much resource are these patients using, not just treatment, but how much are they demanding from the system in terms of consultations, hospitalizations, um, surgeries, all of these sorts of things. So we get all this nice information from here. It's about 300 variables per patient. But then we also ask the same patient to complete a corresponding self-completion element. And this provides us with the usually over overlooked issues associated with diseases. So we, we capture the indirect costs um, and we capture the quality of life of the patient. So then we end up with an end-to-end -end full picture of what the burden looks like within that disease area. In terms of what we're doing, we're doing it everywhere. So we are, we've run it in Europe, we're expanding further into Europe. We've just read out on the paediatrics data as well, so we've got, that's actually 1,050 paediatrics patients from across Europe, which again is a healthy sample. Some very interesting stuff coming out, but not ready to publish yet. Uh, we have all, already got about 600 patients into our Chesh US program, and we've just completed the pilot in China as well, and we will be expanding the study into a couple of the provinces. So in terms of some of the data, it's, we all like to see data, otherwise we wouldn't be here at this hour. Um, we, uh, this, this is the, 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 uh, a brief picture of what we captured. So we captured 996 haemophilia A patients and 285 haemophilia B patients. So this is a healthy sample, as I'm sure you can imagine. The demographics look pretty normal. Age distribution was heavily skewed to the left because aging in haemophilia is a new thing, but something that we need to prepare for. And we, this is where we really do get our meaningful analysis. So when we're thinking about unmet need, we need to consider these things. So we've got nearly approximately 40% of all patients, if we look at the haemophilia A side, on some form of on-demand therapy. And that's, you know, it's, it's not great. It means that these patients are maybe have availability of prophylaxis but are electing to go on on-demand, so they're unprotected. They're they're, they are having higher bleeds, they've got more complications. So we, we, we can see that and we can cut the analysis accordingly subsequently. So we've got interest in analyses on primary prophy, so on and so forth. So we, we've literally got, I could, we could easily have a death by PowerPoint and I could present a hundred different things that we've discovered in the data, but we've got like four kind of nice, concise key messages that we've derived. Everybody will present on bleeds, so we've decided to look at joint morbidity, mental health, work productivity, and direct and indirect costs, just as a, as a brief insight. So in terms of joint morbidity, um, this is intu not intuitive as soon as you look at it, but intuitive when you think about it. Um, so primary prophy, we do have joint morbidity there, which is higher than you'd expect, but it's still lower than everywhere else. So I think this is quite a nice message to say, yes, things are getting better, but there's a hell of a lot more we need to do because all these patients are under 35, but they've got some form of chronic joint destruction. But the, the other prophylaxis group is anybody who's not primary prophylaxis, so that's there's an age range between 18 and 88 in that group, so there is massive heterogeneity. So we'd, we'd have to break that out further, but for illustrative purposes, we've kept it concise. And on-demand regimens are more likely to have um, joint damage than your primary prophy. So 
In terms of this was quite satisfying from a representation point of view, all the action is where you would expect it to be, at ankles, elbows and knees. But I did, so as a patient, one of my, one of my um, problem joints is my neck, so I put it into my own survey because I had the discretion to, and there was 19 patients who have a problem joint in their neck as well. So if you're here, I'd love to say hello and discuss me bad. If that's, I think that's illegal. Apologies, yeah. Um, so we, we've published, so I am an academic as well as a patient, and we've published on this extensively. We've got a couple of papers out. And this isn't rocket science. We are not splitting the atom here, but, you know, the more joint morbidity you have, the more impaired your quality of life is. This is what causes disability. Yes, bleeds are bad, but the acute episodes of the condition, this is the thing that causes disability within haemophiliacs. It's joint deterioration. So we've done a really nice study that, like myself and my team, who are fantastic, but socially inept, have put together some lovely stuff on, in this, yeah. And one of the other areas is um, anxiety and depression. So we were, when we started to mine our data, we were pretty surprised by the amount of diagnosed anxiety and depression. Um, so on the left, this is the reported, the patient self-reported um, depression from a tool called EQ5D, which is a generic um, quality of life tool. And one of the domains within it asks the patient to report what their level of anxiety or depression is been not, not at all, all the way through to extremely. And, you know, there's quite a lot of patients that have said, yes, I do have issues with anxiety and depression, but that's self-diagnosed and physicians in the maroon may challenge that. Um, but then we've got the physician reported as well, because we get access to the medical record. We ask the physician, does this patient have a diagnosis or issue with any anxiety or depression? And we get tick box. Um, responses on other concomitant conditions that the patient might have with their haemophilia. So you can see that the numbers are quite high even when reported by the physicians and the numbers of patients having treatment are, are also quite high. So we've, we've also got this in a poster somewhere comparing to normative data and it is a little bit higher than the general population as well. And it's also more common in inhibitor patients, which is definitely worth a note. Um, this is something that we're quite passionate about as well. So something that certainly has been missing from the literature um, is work productivity and activity impairment because it's very easy to ignore this side of things because we've got access to prophylaxis. But is there a day-to-day -day implication of being a haemophiliac that may be a little bit more subtle and nuanced and difficult to capture or measure. And I think this tool does it very well. So this is a generic um, patient reported outcome measure that gives insight into both the work impairment and the activity impairment of a patient. If we look at the top left, so the number, so patients with more joint morbidity are more likely to have uh, work, work productivity losses. Again, it's not rocket science, but it's really nice to have a validated metric to show that this is, this is the implication of progressive joint, joint damage. Also, we see a correlation between, a, a, an inverse correlation between EQ5D and work productivity as well. So as um, EQ5D goes up, we, we see a increase in productivity. So, yeah. And then we've got anxiety and depression as well. So this is correlated with work productivity loss too. So yeah, we've got some nice messages from there. In terms of costs, this was kind of the meat of what we've done. So our, our mission was to go out, get very detailed information, granular information, on a patient level and then understand what drives the costs and what drives the burden. So the numbers, 
yes, we're, we're reporting this in, in euros, which is just a con common denomination, but when you think about what this means, there's a lot of patients spending time in hospital, serious hospitalizations as well. There's definitely more surgery occurring in these, this patient population than the general population. But also, it's quite complex as well. So we, this is, uh, some of these variables are a composite of um, several put together. There's about 40 different costs in here. So yeah, you can see the things that mainly drive are hospitalizations due to bleed events, because if you have one hospitalization for an intracranial bleed or gastio, gastio bleed, this patient will go into the it got, will, will go into the emergency room and then spend time in will, what will be the most expensive hospital department, which can cost thousands upon thousands a day. And remember, these costs are exclusive of factor costs. This is the part where we are really passionate to, as it refers back to the work productivity loss. So the methodology that we employed was a human capital approach, which means that we capture and quantify every opportunity cost the system. So you'll see here that the loss of earnings is the biggest implication for haemophilia. So the amount of time lost from work or the amount, if a patient has had to re retire early due to their condition or take time away from work, this is a huge implication for not just the system but also the patient. So there's a lot of patients that are missing out on being able to function as a general member of society. But the, the other thing that I really like from this as well is the caregiver angle. People always forget the caregiver. I, I know my wife has a lot of problems having to put it with me. That, that's outside of haemophilia, including haemophilia. But it shouldn't be overlooked. It's, there's a lot of time and hours and opportunity cost. Because for every hour a caregiver is providing, they are potentially losing hours of work or investment into their own careers and that, that is a real thing that we fail to really capture as a society when making decisions. So in terms of concluding comments, like I say, this is a brief insight into the CHESS programme and we, we do literally have lots, like dozens of insights into one met need, but I just wanted to kind of present some of the less conventional um, outcomes that we, we ne don't necessarily talk about so much. But we know that there's, the thing that was interesting from this, when we remove the drug costs, because let's not, let's not beat it around the bush, the drug costs are significant, but when we remove them, that's the part that I'm interested in is what is happening to the patient on the ground. And when we look at this, the actual costs are actually greater to the patients than to the system. So the, the work productivity loss and inability to participate in the workforce account for about 60% of that non-drug cost, which is significant. It means there's a lot of patients that are not being able to live the life the way they want to and caregivers. But in terms of just closing, the, it's important that, just going back to the top, that a multi-stakeholder approach to these things is absolutely essential because otherwise the information is not disseminated in the right way. So we, we work via unrestricted research grants in the University of Chester and we, when we conduct our burden of illness studies we always work with the appropriate charity organisations but we, we have disseminated this. This is now with HTA bodies there's various universities from around Europe using this data, and we have used it for political responses to ICWIG and for the contaminated blood inquiry in the UK. But it's, it's important that I thank the patients and physicians who have made this possible. But that's chess in a nutshell, and I think Mark's next, so I'll just hand over to Professor Skinner. <laughs>